It is Thursday, November 16th, 2017. This is the Distant Peasant Podcast. I am your host, Jeff, the Distant Peasant. On today's show, joining me, all the way from the United Kingdom, good friend Claire. She's going to talk to us about things like there, current events with Brexit, uh, what it's like not to have everyone armed there, and a few other things. I uh, just want to remind everyone up at the top, headquarters is always distantpeasant.com. If you want to support the show, there's a link there. Click on it. On the side, look for the button that says, What is the Distant Peasant? You can find a PayPal button on that page. Throw a few bucks in if you want. Uh, I've been thinking a lot about capital investment for the show. And uh, definitely a new microphone is up first. I do my best with the equipment that I have. Uh, but as far as I can tell, like that's going to be first priority because uh, this mic is incredibly temperamental and hard to make sound good, uh, but no need to bore you with technical stuff. Just wanted to remind you that if you want to throw a few bucks in, um, I will be reinvesting it and making this a real thing. Speaking of real things, here's my real interview with Claire, the Distant Peasants official number one UK Corresponded. Joining me today on today's show is my friend Claire, who lives in the United Kingdom near Liverpool, originally from Yorkshire. She's an ex Green Party MP candidate, an educator, the queen of the Michael Brooks Show Discord, and current Labour Party member. Claire, how are you doing? I'm pretty good, thank you, Jess. How are you? I'm well. I'm doing okay, as well as I can be. Uh, to start off, you know, we've had several mass shootings of the past couple of weeks in the United States. I'm sure even you're aware of that. Um, I really wanted to talk to you about, you know, many people are aware, some people maybe not, that the UK is a largely just gun-free country. There are not many guns around in the hands of anyone. Um, what's that like, Claire? Well... I mean, on a day-to-day basis, no, you don't see any guns. I mean, the first time I saw a gun was when I went to the United States and spent some time in Virginia. Until I went there, I'd never seen a gun in my life before. Um, But people do have guns here, and I think it's a little bit um, of a myth that there are no guns in the UK, because people do have them for sports and shooting, um, but they're just much, much better regulated and restricted. Um, so there are guns here, but they're just not common. What um, kind of guns? Because uh, I've done a... I'm not into guns, but I have shot a gun or two before. Um, but they were always bolt action or shotguns. Uh, no semi-automatics, no bump stocks, nothing like that. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty the same here. I mean, all automatics are banned, um, semi-automatics are banned, but people will have shotguns. Um, I'm not a huge expert on the different types of guns available. Um, although I do know that when I was in Virginia, um, this is quite a funny story, I was hanging out with some rednecks who I met, and they were shooting in the back backyard. I'm sorry, you were hanging out with some who now? <laughs> some rednecks. Some some what now? Is that that's, that is our word, honey? That is our word. I'm kidding. Please continue. Um, and they were shooting bottles of Budweiser, you know, with their guns, and <laughs> I was like, "Oh, I'll have a go." And they laughed at me, you know, expecting me to be a complete failure because I'd never seen a gun before, let alone shot one, and I outshot all of them. <laughs> so yeah. I got- I've got more bot- hit more bottles than all of them, and I've never seen guns disappear so quickly in my life before. A gun is a tool designed to be used by humans. It's uh, supposed to be easy to use. <laughs> like, uh, just just my opinion. So, uh, handguns. Uh, if I was in the UK and I was just some dude living in the city, uh, and I wanted to buy a handgun, what would I have to do? Can I get one? No, you can't buy hand- handguns anymore because... Um, the one big difference between our two, two countries seems to be that if we do have a massacre, and we have had some, well, we've had three since 1980. Wow. Uh, so 
But e after each of those, our government tightened up our legislation even more. So there was one in 1980 where somebody um, shot, I think it was something like 10 or 12 people, I can't remember the exact details, um, with a shotgun. And so shotgun regulation was tightened up. And then there wasn't another mass shooting at all until um, Dunblane. I don't know if you've heard of that. It might be quite no, I'm afraid well. not. Sorry. Um, that's okay. It, Dunblane is a school in Scotland, um, and somebody basically shot an entire classroom of kids up there um, in 1997 with hand, with handguns, and. Basically, as soon as that happened, our government banned handguns and made it impossible for people to own um, pistols and anything considered a handgun. As these uh, the types of guns that were allowed to be purchased by the public in the UK, um, as, as that was reduced, um, you of course still have some of those guns already sold in the hands of people. Um, how did the government handle that? Did they confiscate them? Did they buy them? Did they just wait for them to become obsolete? So I was, because uh, I knew we were going to be talking about guns, I had a quick look. Um, and apparently this has been going on since the times of William Orange and in the, in the 1500s. And a lot of the regulation, the initial regulation, came about because of fear of people shooting the monarchy. So yeah, a lot of this legislation is quite old. It goes back a very long time. Um, but like I was saying, with each kind of new instant, it's been tightened up even more. So there was a lot more regulations after World War I as well, because the government feared people were going to be bringing back weapons um, from the war. And obviously there was a huge amount of unrest at that time as well. So they were fearing the peasant uprising at the time. Um, and then after each of the mass shootings, like I was saying, it's been regulated. But the way they seem to have done it um, is by having gun amnesties. But the slight difference is that people have been paid compensation for guns that they've handed in. Um, so the police run them and anybody who takes in a gun um, will get the value of that gun awarded back to them in compensation. There's like an incentive for people to hand them in. I mean, many, many times you'll hear in the United States, um, if you get to this point in an argument with somebody who's opposing uh, gun control or changes in gun policy is, well, there are already so many guns out there in the United States, that is, uh, illegal and legal, that um, even if you pass a regulation, um, it won't do any good because there's enough for every man, woman, and child to, you know, get three or something. <laughs> um, so I think it's important to think about, like, how we're going to deal with that problem because it may be raised cynically, but they're not wrong, right? Like, uh, No, absolutely. And, you know, there are huge differences between the two countries as well in terms of, you know, your constitution, etc. Um, so I'm not for one minute kind of here to, to preach and say this is the way that you know the Americans should do it and look at us we're so great on it because like I say some of our legislation goes back centuries and it would be impossible I think for you to completely escape that overnight there I think it does have to be a gradual thing for people to get on board with it um because I don't think it would work over there for your government to say, right, that's it, all guns are banned. Take them all to your nearest police station tomorrow. Um, even if there was like a money incentive, I think it would be an impossible task. But I, I do think it could be done. I, like I said, I'm really not an expert on the types of guns at all. I know people, you know, we make the joke that uh, you, you need to know everything and anything there is to know about uh, guns and weapons or common arms gun control, but you don't. Uh, and uh, I just really wanted the perspective of someone who like gets to live the experience of just not seeing weapons all the time, Claire. I go out to the grocery store and the dude in front of me in the checkout line is packing. And, you know, every, everywhere I go, you know, it seems like somebody's armed and, and it, it makes yeah. me feel uneasy. 
Yeah, I mean, I certainly didn't feel safe, any safer at all in Virginia around guns. If, you know, if anything, I felt a hell, hell of a lot less safe knowing they were there. Um, and it was just a total weird culture shock for me to see people with them and to walk into, oh, God, I can't remember the name of the shop. Is it Bass Pro? Is that what it is? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Walk into a Bass Pro and see just like racks and racks of guns that people could just buy. It's just just a total different world to me. By the way, them fellas, you were shooting, they were shooting beer cans. Everyone knows Pap's Blue Ribbon is where you shoot. So uh, policing in the UK, um, I know some police officers carry weapons. Many don't. Some are in the trunk. Um, what is that like? And um, and how do the police feel about that there? Well, I mean, my <laughs> this is a confession that not, not everybody will think is popular, but um, my dad was in the police, which, you know, according to some people, makes me a traitor by default. But he was, um, he was a village cop for years and years, and he was never armed. Um, and a lot of his colleagues were never armed, and I don't think any of them would ever want to be armed um, but they always knew that if they had to deal with a situation then they could call in the armed response unit so there are police officers with guns but the vast majority of police officers you meet on the street are not armed at all. so really it's there's just like a particular unit in a lot of cases that just like waits to be called in in case the use of force with a gun is required yeah. Yeah, certainly in the vast majority of the country. I have a feeling London might be slightly different. I think there are slightly more armed units down there. But certainly in the majority of the country, police are not armed at all. Um, and again, it goes down to that safety thing. You know, I trust our police a hell of a lot more because you can go up to them and talk to them and know that if you upset them, they're not just going to turn a gun out on you and shoot you. Um, and I don't know, I haven't had many run into the police, thankfully, but um, from people I know who have, it seems that they use the ability to talk to people a lot more than reason, rather than kind of intimidating people with guns. I think in a lot of cases, humans are just going to use the tools that you give them. And so, you know, if you give them weapons they'll use weapons to enforce compliance like it, it would just make sense in their heads why would you give me this tool if you did not allow me to use it i think some of it comes down to the power culture as well though you know they have a gun and they feel more powerful so therefore they act like assholes a little bit more um how much a role do you think um the racial uh composition and history in the uk plays a role in police culture. You know, it's just a matter of fact that uh, a system of white supremacy and slavery in this country, um, the police really are the direct heirs in this country to old slave patrols, which um, one thing I always tell people is that, you know, slavery requires a police state. You just have to have units of men walking around looking for papers and escaped slaves. Um, so, do you think that the different racial climate and history in the UK, how do you think that's influenced the police culture there? Um, it's kind of difficult for me to say because I grew up in a very rural area that was very white um, and hardly any crime at all. So, I didn't really have much dealings with the vast majority of police. Like I say, my dad was like the village policeman, but he dealt with <laughs> like silly things like sheep going missing more than anything. Um, so it's not something I've had a huge amount of experience with. Um, I suppose going to university in a bigger city, um, I saw a slightly different perspective in that when you were out on a night, the police were a little bit more controlling um, and they certainly did use their authority to a greater extent than I'd known before. Now, being a sort of white girl, I can't really comment on how that would feel as a, a black person, because there's certainly a degree of racial, um, racist bias with the police here as well. I mean, certainly if you speak to 
people who live particularly in areas like South London. I remember it. I mean, it sounds kind of silly, but you know, just off the top of your head, when someone thinks of the UK, they think, "Oh, yeah, it's just white people, right?" And then remember the the Grenfell Tower fire. I remember seeing like pictures on the street of like all those people whose you know homes had been destroyed and who lost loved ones and friends. It was a very diverse crowd. I saw all kinds of colors of people, you know, uh, down there. Um, my only point is just that, like, the UK, um, they don't, you know, there's not the legacy of slavery that we have here, but it's it's not just a bunch of lily white people, and that's why things are better there. Like, <laughs> it sounds maybe <laughs> silly to say it that way, but, you know, there are large parts of the United States, and that's what they think. Oh, you know. It's it's all just well, racial animosity. Like you take away the racial animosity, and every country becomes socialist, right? I think there's this kind of idyllic view of England sometimes that we're we're all just sit around all day drinking tea and eating crumpets and watching a bit of cricket. Um, but no, we're a very racially diverse country. Um, I'd say I mean there's certainly different areas of the country that are different in that, but no, we have a, a huge amount of racial. And speaking of that diversity, it's there's been a backlash, right? And, and that backlash movement was fed into this this Brexit uh, campaign that actually passed, and um, it's been in the news again. Um, I saw opinion polls that now confirm that the majority of UK citizens uh, do not want to leave the U- European Union. Um, I'm not an expert on UK political mechanisms at all, but it is my understanding that um, Parliament doesn't have to follow that referendum and they do not have to leave the European Union. Nobody is making them. Um, They're doing it to save face at this point. Do you have hope that maybe it won't happen? Uh, My opinion on this seems to change daily at the moment. I live in eternal hope that it won't happen. Oh, and do I and did I have that right? Sorry, is yeah, I no. is my understanding correct? Uh, yeah, I mean, I would want us to stay in the EU as long as possible. I don't think the EU was ever perfect, um, and it certainly needed to change. But yeah, it was an idiotic decision. I mean, it seems to me the worst part of it is the the euro, um, which was not handled appropriately. But you guys like. A lot of that stuff you don't have to worry about because you got a bunch of exemptions from it. Yeah, and that's that's the even more frustrating thing about it is that we have all these special deals in place to make it the EU deal that we wanted, but people want to give up on all of it, including all the good stuff as well. I mean, what p- people don't realise is a lot of our labour laws, for, exe- for example, come from the EU, and it terrifies me, particularly if the Conservatives do stay in power, like how much of those they're going to revoke when we leave. Um, Because they're already kind of, you know, anti-strike and anti-union. And the only thing stopping them at the moment is EU regulation. Because like a lot of these regulations, like theoretically, if you were to to revert, some of them would revert back to like old IMF treaties and that might be fine. Or they might revert back to other regulations from the past. But in a lot of cases the laws and regulations that will be disappearing will be replaced by shrug of shoulders. And so how is that going to work exactly? Well, I mean, like best case scenario, you would have everything written out and ready to go in place on day one. And uh, first of all, they don't. And second of all, even if they did, it would still be an incredibly chaotic transition that would likely cause a lot of misery and time for everyone. And I don't know, just, it just seems so suicidal, Claire. <laughs> Tell me about it. Um, I have absolutely zero faith in the people who are running the negotiations at the moment. Every story that seems to come out just confirms that to me as well. They're just making mess after mess of it. And um, improvising. Yeah, they don't know what they're doing. I mean, the fact that on the very first day, David Davis, who's our EU minister turned up without a single piece of paper in his hand 
and sat down opposite the negotiators who had files and files of like legislation to go through. And he was just so underprepared. And he kind of giggles his way through it and kind of makes a few jokes in the media. And he doesn't have a clue what he's doing. Um, and, you know, he's backed by Theresa May, who I don't think has a clue what she's doing either. I mean, I think this one of the, the central problem is that, like, I, these people don't seem to realize that the UK needs the EU much more than the EU needs the UK. Yeah, exactly. Like any any member of the EU, one country can botch the entire deal. It has to be unanimous. <laughs> I mean, I I do believe we're going to come out of it with some kind of deal. And I, I don't know. I, part of that deal is going to have to involve still following some EU regulations if we want to trade with them. I mean, there are also, like, border problems, right? Yeah, there's, I mean, there's huge border problems between Ireland, yeah, the Ireland, Ireland exactly. the Republic of Ireland, um, that they don't have a clue how they're going to sort out. They're still arguing about how much it's going to cost and how much we have to pay the EU to even sort of start this whole process. Rem- and, remember how you were going to take all those dirty EU taxes and you were going to put uh-huh. them back into the National Health Service? Yeah. Those were good times. I want, cool. wanted to ask you two two more things about it because, like, Theresa May is incredibly unpopular, and I'm I'm just I don't mean to sound stupid, but I'm unaware of um, I know a little bit about elections and their calling in a parliamentary system, and they must be called within a certain amount of time. But um, you know, if she loses the confidence of her own party um like is there any chance that you know she might get the boot in a relatively short amount of time oh there's every chance um there's already tory mps plotting behind her back to get rid of her um i think the one one big difference that people might not be aware of is that we don't directly elect her as prime minister we just elect members of parliament right you vote for your mp and then yeah. they will they yeah. choose their their prime minister. Yeah. So really it's up to the Tory party themselves who is the prime minister. Now, if enough of them, I think it takes 48 of them to sign a no confidence deal. If enough of them sign it against her and evict her as leader, then they just pick another leader. You know, in order to get any kind of public public confidence back, there would be pressure on that new leader to call an election as soon as possible. But with the poll, the way the poll stands at the moment, they'd have zero chance of winning. Is there any? And I, I presume like there's no other um, like competent uh, Tory leader behind Theresa May. Um, it's morons all the way down, right? Yeah, there's some scary possibilities. We have um, Jacob Rees-Mogg, who is as right wing as they come, but seems to be quite popular because he just comes across as a upper class idiot who people seem to like for some bizarre reason that I will never understand. Um, and then of course there's Boris again who has that kind of somewhat popular appeal. Although I, I think if you say so <laughs> just look at that guy. I know, but you know, Trump so <laughs> oh another like bloated white dude. There's Michael Gove, who's always plotting, who was our education secretary for a while, who screwed up our schools so much that I don't think he would ever be trusted. Um, I think personally, and this is just a personal opinion, it's not really based on any evidence, I think it will be someone relatively new and unheard of, because I think they, as a party, they need a bit of fresh blood and somebody who isn't tainted by all these stories. Presumably that new person, if they have any kind of career instincts, will immediately call a new election and then probably yeah. not be prime minister for very long. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, that's the hope. On a personal level, this is um, this is just kind of something that I, I think about. My wife is a second generation Polish immigrant, right? so her parents are from Poland. Um, mm-hmm. There is a lot of uh, anti-Polish 
violence or not a, maybe not a lot of violence but there has been some violence uh in the uk and some discrimination and um really just discriminatory behavior and talk towards people from poland there yeah. um do you know anything about that sort of thing why do these people not like poles um what's wrong with them <laughs> <laughs> there's nothing wrong with poles um I think a lot of it was stirred up by the likes of Mr. Farage and UKIP. And, you know, this country has a lot of problems with government funding being cut in areas like education, health, uh, social welfare, and people needed someone to blame. Um, so, you know, they spun it as don't blame the government, blame these immigrants who are coming in and stealing your jobs and making you have to wait to see a doctor and making your child's school have too many kids in it. Yes, reality, to, to remind people, sorry, but to remind yeah. people that after the crash in 2008, um, while the United States has not recovered nearly as well as it should or could have, in large parts of Europe, including the UK, um, austerity, extreme austerity, was the measure of the day. And so public spending was slashed to the bone and... Taxes were raised, um, exactly. and that happened for years, still happening in some ways, and a lot of that causes resentment and stress among the population, which, like you were saying, the yeah, UKIP they, and Nile Farage, yeah. yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. No, they just look for someone to blame, and, you know, it was, it was Polish people and other Eastern European immigrants that got the blame from a lot of sectors of society, and... Yes, there was a lot of violence and, you know, sadly that increased after the Brexit vote because people seemed to have this idea in their head that they could suddenly get rid of all these immigrants and they were going to tell them this and they were going to put up hate signs and target their shops and throw racial abuse at them in the streets to tell them to go home, etc. But it, it just frustrates me so much because there's no reasoning with people like that either. You can't get them to see that actually immigration is a good thing for this country and it produces far more wealth than it takes out of the country. And, you know, culturally as well, we've gained, we've gained so much from immigration in this country. As well. Yeah, not to play like the identity politics card too hard, but I've actually always really felt that like diversity in and of itself, real diversity top to bottom, right? Um, is good for a society because it, it you get a new synthesis over time of all the greatest and best ideas uh, from all different kinds of cultures. In my opinion. Yeah, exactly. You know, music, food, art, you name it. You know, if we just stayed in our own little clusters, we wouldn't have developed anywhere near as much as we have. Before we leave the UK, tell me why monarchy is bad, Claire. <laughs> Why, why do you, why are you sitting here with me doing an interview and not actively raising an armed peasant militia to overthrow <laughs> your ridiculous system of rule by birth? Tell me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, this is where I'm going to get into trouble for relatives <laughs> in my family who love the monarchy if they're listening. Um, I just, I can't stand the whole thing. <laughs> drives me insane in all seriousness of course the monarchy is like largely ceremonial there um but still like not kidding like it should still be abolished it should i mean it is mainly ceremonial but a lot of our laws and um government processes are still linked to the monarchy somehow so there would have to be big changes you know we would need a head of state and that would need kind of defining, and we'd probably need a constitution finally writing. Um, yeah, you don't you don't things. have a written constitution, right? <laughs> we did not. No, we did not. Um, there was. I remember there was some people were attempting to crowdsource one, but I don't know how far they got. Um, so yeah, I mean there would be changes, and it would be a significant change. Obviously, it's not just a matter of getting rid of this person with a crown on her head. How much money does uh, is the royal family worth, and, and how much do that do they get from uh, you, the taxpayer? 
Oh, I can't remember the exact. I mean, it's, you know, it's just, not, yeah. yeah. Not this is not a pop quiz, but like, aren't they? <laughs> isn't the queen a billionaire though? Yeah, she was named in the um, Paradise Papers as being a person who is stashing money away in various tropical islands. Um, I mean, the, you know, people always use the argument that, oh, they bring in so much money from tourism. Um, but are you seriously telling me people would just stop coming to the UK if we didn't have the Queen anymore? Because we've still got the palaces and we've still got the history. I've, I've actively and avoided the UK come. because you have a monarch. <laughs> nobody actually comes to see the actual Queen because you don't see her. People come to see the stuff that would still be there if she has gone. Um, I don't know, the whole thing is silly to me. Um, somebody else was telling me, one of our mutual friends whose name escapes me right now, that they think a large part of the monarchy's popularity is uh, rolled up into the the person who is the monarch at the moment, and that the queen is relatively popular and well regarded, even by people who, you know, I'm not a monarchist, but I got no problem with it. Well, until this Panama Papers thing, right? Um, how true do you think that is? Do you think these Panama Paper revelations will cause her to be less popular and thus the support for the monarchy might fall? Or even if it doesn't, uh, if when she's gone, uh, the crown passes to Charles, or whatever his goofy-ass name is. <laughs> I think that there's some truth in that. I think what the one advantage of the monarchy that I can see is that it does provide some stability. I mean, you know, we've had the Queen for year i should know how many years she's been on the throne um we've had her for so long that she has been this center head of stability that no matter what else is happening the queen has been there um and a lot of older people i think appreciate that charles is not well liked at all he's still disliked for his role in diana and divorcing diana etc um i think William and Kate are slightly more popular, so if they were to miss Charles out and go straight to William and um, Kate, then I think the popularity would maintain. I mean, it's something stupid like 75%, I think, still want a monarchy here, so it is a big battle to, to try and overcome. I mean, I guess if I was in a compromising mood and didn't have my pitchfork sharpened, I would say... Um, Maybe a monarchy's fine, but this one, uh, too big, too lavish, too rich. Yeah, I, I'd agree with that. But I, they have a lot of wealth that isn't just linked to them being monarchs. You know, they own a lot of land and they've got a lot of historical wealth that wouldn't disappear, even if they didn't get tax funding anymore. Um, so they would always be one of the richest families in the country. Um, well... No, you could just take their stuff. Like, I mean, it's just take their stuff. Like, I'm not saying, like, take everything and leave them in the street, but just, you know, <laughs> I'm sorry, this is a tax. Like, this, we're passing it's a tax like, bill. I want her crown. I want her crown. <laughs> Queen of the DMBS Discord, indeed. Jeez, how much do you think that thing be worth? You'd never have to work again, or your kids, or you could start your own monarchy with that crown. I could. You could sell it and buy a smaller crown and use the difference in money to, like, found your own nation. No, I, ju I just want to wear it around town, you know, <laughs> just for the fun of it. I mean, monarchies do suck, but when you're playing fantasy, like, you always want to be a knight or a lord. Nobody ever plays uh, um, an RPG or something and chooses to be the dirty peasant who shovels for shit all day. True. Yeah. Is that something wrong with our society, though, that we do always want to be top? Uh, no. I think it's just... Just an evolution thing. I don't know. It's just a... I think, honestly, it's just like a... It's just a, a romanticization of uh, the past. And, you know, knights and lords and ladies are cool. If I'm being real. Um, Game of Thrones pissed me off this season, but in general, I like that genre in the first four or five seasons. 
Yeah, yeah. I'm like, do you like, you know, everybody likes, well, maybe not everybody, but lots of people like dragons and knights and sword fights and stuff. Well, we know you've got your dragon art, so we know how much of a fan <laughs> you are. I took those paintings down. <laughs> really? Yes, oh, because I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> don't be embarrassed. Well, and then Jane was like, "Can you just take them down?" I was like, "Okay." <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, I love dragons. I love Game of Thrones and fantasy as a general genre. This is a little far afield, but maybe this will make it in to the podcast because this is something I've always thought about. The show, what's what the Game of Thrones show? And I'm about to spoil the shit out of it if you haven't seen it. So, um, not for you, but for anyone listening. Uh, the showrunners, after they've run out of book um, plot, because the rest aren't written yet, they've lost the point. Because if you read those books, it is a pretty heavy-handed critique of feudalism and fundamentalist religion, in my opinion. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. And I think the show, I mean, in the last season, was not good at all, in my opinion. I mean, it was good viewing, and it's good if you can not think about it too much. Yeah, it's become like the tits and dragons show. Yeah, and um, there's some, you know, some cool special effects still, um, but yeah, the story has gone. I mean, I guess they didn't spoil it too much, but like my point is, is that it's not about this house winning or that house winning or that character winning. Like, look at all these blood feuds that are still going in the show and in the books. So many people are dying, and it's, you know, a lot of times, it's the small folk who are getting their houses raided and burned and getting raped and killed and enslaved. It's awful. Mm -hmm. Uh, This system of blood inheritance and loyalty and feudalism is barbaric and awful for the vast majority of people. Like, that is the point. War is bad. Stop it. (laughs) War and this stupid feeling, I guess, of being attached to the the land you happen to be born on is something I'd never understood. Like, you know, I like Britain and I like the people and the culture here, but I don't really feel any huge attachment to the place and wanting to defend it constantly or... I certainly would not go to war to defend it. Um, it not even against the French? Well, yeah, maybe the Welsh as well. Oh. Um, <laughs> Shots fired! <laughs> um, I don't know, it's just, it's, just, it's just a very strange concept to me to have this nationalist, nationalistic pride. I have, I have crapped on religion and my own Christianity past a lot lately, but I will say one thing, um, that it did influence my thinking positively in, which is that when I was growing up and thinking about, okay, uh, who's born where, how do they get to heaven, how does God judge those who, say, are born a Hindi in India, um, you know, the kinds of questions you begin to ask when you're 12, 13, 14, going through confirmation. And uh, if you come to the conclusion that, well, it would be ridiculous for a perfect good being like God to judge you based on who your parents are or where you were born, then you begin to realize that that doesn't matter. And that the fact that you were born in a rich country like the United Kingdom or the United States or born a white person or born straight or born male just means that you got lucky uh, in our cultural and societal view, but that ultimately God doesn't care. Um, there might not be a god. <laughs> That's what I've concluded uh, since then. But uh, this idea that like all that stuff is just a matter of chance um, yeah. really puts it in perspective. And I think oh, I don't know. I'm a huge advocate of traveling. You know, I'm very lucky that I've traveled a lot and seen a lot of different countries and different people. And I think the more you get to know different places and different people, you realize just how similar everybody actually is. And a lot of the differences are quite false and they're portrayed by the media to be quite false. You spend any time on the continent or much time? On which continent, sorry? The continent, the one closest to you. (laughs) The continent, my continent. (laughs) Um, Europe, yeah, I've travelled around Europe a lot. Um, 
this is something that you talk about, you know, traveling. Like, I guess I encourage that. Some people don't have the money. But some people are just afraid because they don't want to go somewhere where they can't understand anybody. Um, Claire, tell everyone that everyone in Europe speaks English. <laughs> more, more or less. Uh, you, they do. You just gotta. You just gotta talk loudly and point. <laughs> um, most yeah, most people will understand English. Um, or at least not, know someone nearby who does. A few phrases. I mean, I was quite lucky that when I was at university, airfares were really cheap. It was often cheaper for me to fly somewhere in Europe than it was to go home on the train for the weekend. Um, so we went all over the place. Um, we went to Prague, Madrid, Barcelona, uh, Dublin, uh, Warsaw, Amsterdam, lots. Um, and yeah, we never had any problems with language at all. Um, because you don't, yeah. you speak English and only English. I speak English and I used to speak French. Oh, oh, oh good. Ooh, <laughs> uh, Mon cher. I've, for I've forgotten more French. So, um, but yeah, travel. But I mean, I've been, I, I was lucky that I spent a bit of time in East Africa as well. And again, that's a place that seems to scare a lot of people. But like, oh, I don't want to go to Africa. Don't know anything. Don't know anything about the culture. But everyone's really different. But they're really not. Like people have the same values and goals. So I, I called in the majority report once, and I said, um, like something like race, gender, religion, whatever. Like that stuff don't mean nothing. We all want the same things. We're all the same, basically. And, like, somebody called me out on it. They were like, hey, we don't all want the same things, we're, and we're not all the same. And I was like, I hear you. Like, you're talking about, like, fascists and reactionaries, and, and I hear you. But, like, I, what I what I mean by that is, like, you know, what is someone in, uh, like, a poor country in India somewhere, or a poor part of India somewhere, like, what do they want? They want enough food to eat and stuff uh, to drink, uh a house over their head, they want to send their kids to school, you know, they want to get by, maybe save a little bit, maybe buy some stuff that makes them feel good, or have fun, or go to a game, or something like, that's the kind of stuff that everyone, everywhere, basically wants. Yeah, I think, fundamentally, everybody just wants to be happy, don't they? And that, that idea of happiness may differ from person to person, to some extent, and certainly some of the views of happiness may be different. But I think that's everyone's ultimate goal, is that they want to seek happiness through whatever means they can. And for some people that, well, for most people, that's family and relationships and education. Nah, I hate food, people. Et cetera. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, you know, if you are the sort of person who hates people, then your idea of happiness may be living on an island. No, I don't hate people. Uh, and nobody can really do that. Humans are way too socially uh, evolved. Like, imagine that it's like prehistoric times and, you know, all we got is like sticks and stones. And um, there are like 20 humans sitting around a fire. And, you know, there's a big lion like prowling the edge of it, right? That that lion can take out any one or even two or three of them, right? Like, it's stronger, it's faster, it's more vicious, it's a killing machine. And, you know, humans are not as strong or fast or dangerous as lions. But if you get 20 humans together and they can cooperate with each other and communicate with each other and form a plan of action... They can beat a lion easily. Mm -hmm. Like, that is what makes us the most dominant species on the planet. Not our strength, not our intelligence. It is our socialization that makes us awesome. So, like, I, as much as I hate uh, people, I would never want to live by myself on an island. That would suck. Yeah. I mean, if you look at evolutionary-wise, then it's the way our brains have developed to be social creatures. And, you know, we get a lot of... Um, pleasure hormones etc released when we are social do things for the people and we act in kind ways which kind of which makes selfish people so difficult to understand for me because i don't see how they can actually seek any real pleasure from screwing people over 
Um, I think a lot of times it's just a fear. Like a fear of loss, a fear of change. Um, everyone, everyone can, uh, experience, like, what's, like, to show empathy, everyone can also experience what it's like to be afraid of losing something that you care about. And, you know, you don't always respond, uh, rationally or logically or fairly in situations like that, so. I see a lot of those people around me. <laughs> There's a lot of people like that here um, who are are desperate and afraid um, because they feel it and they see it. The world's slipping away and people are getting poorer and um, it's making them anxious and stressed and want to hold on to what's theirs even tighter. Yeah. Well, that goes back to what we were saying before about they look for someone to blame um, in that situation. Right. And just because it's natural doesn't mean that it's good. Don't give in to natural inclinations. We're better than that. Anyway, you were going to educate me on Thanksgiving. As a... <laughs> <laughs> so what I, can, I can do that with you here if you want, if you're not, if you're up for it. Yeah, it's gone. Tell me about that. I, uh, this is, this is a, me. this is just a little, like, pet peeve thing of mine. Like, I'm, uh, I'm not a historian. I don't have any uh, particularly high level historical education. I just like history and I've, I've read some books because I, I like to read about that kind of stuff and listen to some, some stuff. Um, but I should make it clear that I'm not a historian. I, I have a undergraduate level education in music and computers, and that's it. Um, but Thanksgiving is my least favorite holiday probably second maybe to only Columbus Day. No, not even really, because Columbus Day you really don't do all that much. Thanksgiving is already an event. Um Claire, when white people arrived in the Americas for the first time, um first of all, it certainly wasn't fourteen ninety two because there are many we have lots of evidence that many other people may have or probably or might have gotten here before then. Uh, maybe not white people, but people from uh, Eurasia. So the Chinese, there's evidence, the Phoenicians, the Egyptians, there's some suggestion that they got here. The Vikings, there's strong evidence that they got here uh, in the 10 hundreds. Um, and a couple others too, I'd have to look it up. Even even Ireland, apparently some Irish monks, there's a fable that uh, like a hundred of them or so sailed to uh, North America. But anyway... So here come all these white people, and they show up. Uh, we'll start in uh, Pilgrim time, right? So we'll skip over Virginia. And they get there, and they find a beautiful land with, like, a, a brook nearby. The ground is relatively level. It's perfect for farming. And they even find uh, abandoned graves and huts. And so they move in, and they call it theirs. <laughs> wow. Like, they literally, literally moved in on top of the bones of Native Americans who had died because of disease. Disease always, always um, traveled ahead of settlers. <laughs> because yeah. disease just, you know, it moves faster than people can walk mm -hmm. or ships can sail. <laughs> and so a lot of places, white people would show up and there would not be very many Indians or, excuse me, Native Americans around. And um, the fast forward, you know, tens, hundreds of years, the Indians get subjugated and... Um, White people, consciously, unconsciously in this country, tell themselves a story of it was our superior technology and social organization and political structures to the um, maybe you admired, uh, but still somewhat backwards Native Americans who were here. And it just isn't the case. It is unmeditated, uh, unpremeditated biological warfare <laughs> that won us the war against the Native Americans. Our level of technological and social uh, structure between the two continents at the time of Columbus was basically a parody. Like, there is no way 
that European settlers, if they did not have the help of disease, could have conquered North America. And this story of this little thing that we can't see or touch, really, of disease that won us this country in large part, single dermidly, right? Smallpox alone <laughs> does a lot of his work for us. For us to celebrate that as a triumph of American spirit or can do itness or even friendship and reconciliation with the Native Americans, to me, totally misses um, the relevant history and the point. And, it's, and what's more is it's dangerous. It's dangerous for people to have these delusions about themselves and their country. It, it's a way of amberizing the people who lived here before we did and um, making them less than us. And that sort of tendency is not just historic. We, it feeds into our outlook and behavior now in terms of how we view uh, race and the rise of like, xenophobia in this country. So are you starting the war on Thanksgiving then? <laughs> If I'm being completely serious, like, if, if I had to pick a holiday to wage war on, to destroy, like, Thanksgiving would absolutely come first. Like, I would pick it way before Christmas. <laughs> no, you see, the one, the one you need to get rid of is the 4th of July. Oh. Mm. <laughs> Celebrating Ooh, our demise. See, I don't know, that's more, I got mixed feelings there. We all know that, but we explore those mixed feelings. Like every week on this show, so like I, I don't need to get into exactly why I got mixed feelings about July Fourth. Oh, sorry, I said it the wrong way, didn't I? July Fourth. Our Independence oh, Independence Day. No, the Fourth of July is also correct. Uh, Claire, to wrap up, is there anything else that you wanted to end us with? Anything you wanted to shout out? Anything you wanted to get off your chest? What you got? Well, I mean, I could start ranting about education, but I think we've probably talked enough about that. So I shall end by saying everybody should join the TMBS Discord. <laughs> um, left is best and eat the rich. <laughs> Starting with the queen. From her mouth, two guys' ears. <laughs> Thanks, Claire. I really appreciate it. She's a bit old and tough, though. No, nobody. Uh, please don't eat anyone. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> Anti-cannibalism here on the show. Bye. 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 bye.